Trifles by Susan Glassbull. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. First performed by the Provincetown Players at the Wharf Theatre, Provincetown, Massachusetts, August 8, 1916. George Henderson, County Attorney, recorded by Chuck Williamson. Henry Peters, Sheriff, read by Delmar H. Dolbier. Lewis Hale, a neighboring farmer, read by Robert Hoffman. Mrs. Peters, read by Margaret Espayat. Mrs. Hale, read by Christine G. Scene. The kitchen is the now abandoned farmhouse of John Wright. A gloomy kitchen, and left without having been put in order. Unwashed pans under the sink a loaf of bread outside the bread-box, a dish-towel on the table, other signs of incompleted work. At the rear the outer door opens and the sheriff comes in, followed by the county attorney and Hale. The sheriff and Hale are men in middle life. The county attorney is a young man. All are much bundled up and go at once to the stove. They are followed by the two women, the sheriff's wife first. She is a slight, wiry woman, a thin, nervous face. Mrs. Hale is larger, and would ordinarily be called more comfortable-looking, but she is disturbed now, and looks fearfully about as she enters. The women have come in slowly, and stand close together near the door. County Attorney, rubbing his hands. Ah, uh, that feels good. Come up to the fire, ladies. Mrs. Peters, after taking a step forward. I'm not cold. Sheriff unbuttoning his overcoat and stepping away from the stove as if to mark the beginning of official business. Now, Mr. Hale, before we move things about, you explain to Mr. Henderson just what you saw when you came here yesterday morning. By the way, has anything been moved? Are things just as you left them yesterday? Sheriff, looking about. It's just the same. When it dropped below zero last night, I thought I'd better send Frank out this morning to make a fire for us. No use getting pneumonia with a big case on, but I told him not to touch anything except the stove, and you know Frank. Somebody should have been left here yesterday. Oh, yesterday. When I had to send Frank to Morris Center for that man who went crazy. I want you to know I had my hands full yesterday. I knew you could get back from Omaha by today, and as long as I went over everything here myself. Well, Mr. Hale, tell me what happened when you came here yesterday morning. Harry and I had started to town with a load of potatoes. We came along the road from my place, and as I got here I said, I'm going to see if I can't get John Wright to go in with me on a party telephone. I spoke to Wright about it once before, and he put me off saying folks talk too much anyway, and all he asked was peace and quiet. I guess you know about how much he talked himself, but I thought maybe if I went to the house and talked about it before his wife, though I said to Harry that I didn't know as what his wife wanted made much difference to John. Let's talk about that later, Mr. Hale. I do want to talk about that, but tell me now, just what happened when you got to the house? I didn't hear or see anything. I knocked at the door, and still it was all quiet inside. I knew they must be up. It was past eight o'clock. So I knocked again, and I thought I heard somebody say, Come in. I wasn't sure. I'm not sure yet, but I opened the door. This door. Indicating the door by which the two women are still standing. And there in that rocker sat Mrs. Wright. They all look at the rocker. What was she doing? She was rocking back and forth. She had her apron in her hand and was kind of pleading it. And how did she look? Well, she looked queer. How do you mean, queer? Well, as if she didn't know what she was going to do next and kind of done up. How did she seem to feel about your coming? Why, I don't think she minded one way or other. 
She didn't pay much attention. I said, I do, Mrs. Wright. It's cold, ain't it? And she said, is it? And went on kind of pleating at her apron. Well, I was surprised. She didn't ask me to come up to the stove or to set down, but just sat there, not even looking at me. So I said, I want to see John. And then she laughed. I guess you would call it a laugh. I thought of Harry and the team outside, so I said a little sharp, Can't I see John? No, she says, kind of doll-like. Ain't he home, says I. Yes, says she, he's home. Then why can't I see him? I asked her out of patience. Cause he's dead, says she. Dad, says I. She just nodded her head, not getting a bit excited, but rocking back and forth. Why, where is he? says I, not knowing what to say. She just pointed upstairs like that. Himself pointing to the room above. I got up with the idea of going up there. I walked from there to here. Then I says, why, what did he die of? He died of a rope round his neck, says she, and just went on pleating at her apron. Well, I went out and called Harry. I thought I might need help. We went upstairs, and there he was, lying. I think I'd rather have you go into that upstairs, where you can point it all out. Just go on now with the rest of the story. Well, my first thought was to get that rope off. It looked. Stops. Hale's face twitches. But Harry, he went up to him, and he said, No, he's dead all right, and we'd better not touch anything. So we went back downstairs. She was still sitting that same way. Has anybody been notified? I asked. No, says she, unconcerned. Who did this, Mrs. Wright? said Harry. He said it business-like, and she stopped pleating of her apron. I don't know, she says. You don't know, says Harry. No, says she. Weren't you sleeping in the bed with him, says Harry. Yes, says she, but I was on the inside. Somebody slipped a rope round his neck and strangled him, and you didn't wake up, says Harry. I didn't wake up, she said after him. We must have looked as if we didn't see how that could be, for after a minute she said, I sleep sound. Harry was going to ask her some more questions, but I said maybe we ought to let her tell her story first to the coroner or the sheriff, so Harry went fast as he could to River's place, where there's a telephone. And what did Mrs. Wright do when she knew that you had gone for the coroner? She moved from that chair to this one over here. Pointing to a small chair in the corner. And just sat there with her hands held together and looking down. I got a feeling that I ought to make some conversation, so I said I had come to see if John wanted to put in a telephone, and at that she started to laugh, and then she stopped and looked at me, scared. The county attorney, who has had his notebook out, makes a note. I don't know. Maybe it wasn't scared. I wouldn't like to say it was. Soon Harry got back, and then Dr. Lloyd came, and you, Mr. Peters. And so I guess that's all I know that you don't. County Attorney, looking around. I guess we'll go upstairs first, and then out to the barn and around there. To the sheriff. You're convinced that there was nothing important here? Nothing that would point to any motive? Nothing here but kitchen things. The county attorney, after again looking around the kitchen, opens the door of a cupboard closet. He gets up on a chair and looks on a shelf, pulls his hand away, sticky. Here's a nice mess. The women draw nearer. Mrs. Peters to the other woman. Oh, her fruit, it did freeze. To the lawyer. She worried about that when it turned so cold. She said the fire'd go out and her jars would break. Well, 
Can you beat the women? <laughs> Held for murder and worrying about her preserves. I guess before we're through, she may have something more serious than preserves to worry about. Well, women are used to worrying over trifles. The two women move a little closer together. County attorney with the gallantry of a young politician. And yet, for all their worries, what would we do without the ladies? The women do not unbend. He goes to the sink, takes a dipper full of water from the pail, and, pouring it into a basin, washes his hands, starts to wipe them on the roller towel, turns it for a cleaner place. Dirty towels! Kicks his foot against the pans under the sink. Not much of a housekeeper, would you say, ladies? Mrs. Hale, stiffly. There's a great deal of work to be done on a farm. To be sure. And yet with a little bow to her i know there are some dixon county farmhouses which do not have such roller towels gives it a pull to expose its length again those towels get dirty awful quick men's hands aren't always as clean as they might be ah loyal to your sex i see but you and mrs wright were neighbors i suppose you were friends too Mrs. Hale, shaking her head. I've not seen much of her of late years. I've not been in this house. It's more than a year. And why was that? You didn't like her? I liked her all well enough. Farmers' wives have their hands full, Mr. Henderson. And then... Yes? Mrs. Hale, looking about. It never seemed a very cheerful place. No, it's not cheerful. I shouldn't say she had the home-making instinct. Well, I don't know as Wright had, either. You mean that they didn't get on very well? No, I don't mean anything, but I don't think a place would be any cheerfuler for John Wright's being in it. I'd like to talk more about that a little later. I want to get the lay of things upstairs now. County attorney goes to the left, where three steps lead to a stair door. Yeah, I suppose anything Mrs. Peters does will be all right. She was to take in some clothes for her, you know, a few little things. We left in such a hurry yesterday. Yes, but I would like to see what you take, Mrs. Peters, and keep an eye out for anything that might be of use to us. Yes, Mr. Henderson. The women listen to the men's steps on the stairs, then look about the kitchen. I'd hate to have men coming into my kitchen, snooping around and criticizing. Mrs. Hale arranges the pans under sink, which the lawyer had shoved out of place. Of course, it's no more than their duty. Duty's all right, but I guess that deputy sheriff that came out to make the fire might have got a little of this on. Gives the roller towel a pull. Wish I'd have thought of that sooner. Seems mean to talk about her for not having things slicked up when she had to come away in such a hurry. Mrs. Peters, who has gone to a small table in the left rear corner of the room and lifted one end of a towel that covers a pan. She had bread set. Stand still. Mrs. Hale, eyes fixed on a loaf of bread beside the bread box, which is on a low shelf at the other side of the room, moves slowly towards it. She was going to put this in there. Picks up a loaf, then abruptly drops it, in a manner of returning to familiar things. It's a shame about her fruit. I wonder if it's all gone. Gets up on a chair and looks. I think there's some hair that's all right, Mrs. Peters. Yes, hair. Holding it toward the window. This is Cherry Sue. Looking again. I declare I believe that's the only one. Gets down, bottle in her hand, goes to the sink and wipes it off on the outside. She'll feel awful bad after all her hard work in the hot weather. I remember the afternoon I put up my cherries last summer. Mrs. Hale puts the bottle on the big kitchen table, centre of the room, with a sigh is about to sit down in the rocking chair before she is seated realises what chair it is, with a slow look at it, steps back. The chair which she has touched rocks back and forth. Well, I must get those things from the front room closet. Goes to the door at the right, 
but after looking into the other room, steps back. You coming with me, Mrs. Hale? You could help me carry them. They go in the other room, reappear, Mrs. Peters carrying a dress and skirt, Mrs. Hale following with a pair of shoes. My, it's cold in there. Mrs. Peters puts the clothes on the big table and hurries to the stove. Mrs. Hale, examining the skirt. Right was close. I think maybe that's why she kept so much to herself. She didn't even belong to the lady's aid. I suppose she felt she couldn't do her part, and then you don't enjoy things when you feel shabby. She used to wear pretty clothes and be lively when she was Minnie Foster, one of the town girls singing in the choir. But that, oh, that was thirty years ago. This all you was to take in? She said she wanted an apron. Funny thing to want, for there isn't much to get you dirty in jail, goodness knows. But I suppose just to make her feel more natural. She said they was in the top drawer in this cupboard. Yes, here. And then her little shawl that always hung behind the door. Open stair door and looks. Yes, here it is. Quickly shuts door leading upstairs. Mrs. Hale, abruptly moving towards her. Mrs. Peters? Yes, Mrs. Hale? Do you think she did it? In a frightened voice. Oh, I don't know. Well, I don't think she did. Asking for an apron and her little shawl, worrying about her fruit. Mrs. Peters starts to speak, glances up, where footsteps are heard in the room above, in a low voice. Mr. Peters says it looks bad for her. Mr. Henderson is awful sarcastic in a speech, and he'll make fun of her saying she didn't wake up. Well, I guess John Wright didn't wake when they were slipping that rope under his neck. No, it's strange. It must have been done awful crafty and still. They say it was such a funny way to kill a man, rigging it all up like that. That's just what Mr. Hale said. There was a gun in the house. He says that's what he can't understand. Mr. Henderson said, coming out, that what was needed for the case was a motive, something to show anger or sudden feeling. Mrs. Hale, who is standing by the table. Well, I don't see any signs of anger around here. She puts her hand on the dish towel which lies on the table, stands looking down at table, one half of which is clean, the other half messy. It's wiped to hair. Makes a move as if to finish work, then turns and looks at loaf of bread outside the bread box, drops towel, in that voice of coming back to familiar things. Wonder how they are finding things upstairs. I hope she had it a little more red up up there. You know, it seems kind of sneaking, locking her up in town and then coming out here and trying to get her own house to turn against her. But, Mrs. Hale, the law is the law. I suppose it is. I'm buttoning her coat. Better loosen up your things, Mrs. Peters. You won't feel them when you go out. Mrs. Peters takes off her fur tippet, goes to hang it on hook at back of room, stands looking at the under part of the small corner table. She was piecing a quilt. She brings the large sewing basket, and they look at the bright pieces. It's a log cabin pattern. Pretty, isn't it? I wonder if she was going to quilt it or just knot it. Footsteps have been heard coming down the stairs. The sheriff enters, followed by Hale and the county attorney. <laughs> they, they wonder if she was going to quilt it or just knot it. <laughs> the men laugh. The women look abashed. County attorney rubbing his hands over the stove. Frank's fire didn't do much up there, did it? Well, let's go out to the barn and get that cleared up. The men go outside. Mrs. Hale, resentfully. I don't know as there is anything so strange, our taking up our time with little things while we're waiting for them to get the evidence. I don't see as it's anything to laugh about. Mrs. Peters, apologetically. Of course, they've got awful important things on their minds. Pulls up a chair and joins Mrs. Hale at the table. Mrs. Hale, examining another block. Mrs. Peters, look at this one. Here, 
This is the one she was working on, and look at the sewing. All the rest of it has been so nice and even. And look at this. It's all over the place. Why, it looks as if she didn't know what she was about. After she has said this, they look at each other, then start to glance back at the door. After an instant, Mrs. Hale has pulled at a knot and ripped the sewing. Oh, what are you doing, Mrs. Hale? Mrs. Hale, mildly. Just pulling out a stitch or two that's not sewed very good. Threading a needle. Bad sewing always made me fidgety. Mrs. Peters, nervously. I don't think we ought to touch things. I'll just finish up this end. Suddenly stopping and leaning forward. Mrs. Peters? Yes, Mrs. Hale? What do you suppose she was so nervous about? Oh, I don't know. I don't know as she was nervous. I sometimes so awful queer when I'm just tired. Mrs. Hale starts to say something, looks at Mrs. Peters, then goes on sewing. Well, I must get these things wrapped up. They may be through sooner than we think. Putting apron and other things together. I wonder where I can find a piece of paper and string. In that cupboard, maybe. Looking in a cupboard. Why, here's a bird cage. Holds it up. Did she have a bird, Mrs. Hale? Why, I don't know whether she did or not. I've not been here for so long. There was a man around last year selling canaries cheap. But I don't know where she took one. Maybe she did. She used to sing real pretty herself. Mrs. Peters, glancing around. Seems funny to think of a bird here. But she must have had one, or why would she have a cage? I wonder what happened to it. I suppose maybe the cat got it. No, she didn't have a cat. She's got that feeling some people have about cats, being afraid of them. My cat got in her room, and she was real upset and asked me to take it out. My sister Bessie was like that. Queer, ain't it? Mrs. Peters, examining the cage. Why, look at this door. It's broke. One hinge is pulled apart. Looks as if someone must have been rough with it. Why, yes. She brings the cage forward and puts it on the table. I wish if they were going to find any evidence, they'd be about it. I don't like this place. But I'm awful glad you came with me, Mrs. Hale. It would be lonesome for me sitting here alone. It would, wouldn't it? But I tell you what I do wish, Mrs. Peters. I wish I'd come over sometimes when she was here. I— Looking around the room. Wish I had. But you were awful busy, Mrs. Hale, your house and your children. I could have come. I stayed away because it weren't cheerful, and that's why I ought to have come. I—I I never liked this place. Maybe because it's down in a hollow when you don't see the road. I don't know what it is, but it's a lonesome place and always was. I wish I'd come over to see Minnie Foster sometimes. I can see now. Shakes her head. Well, you mustn't reproach yourself, Mrs. Hale. Somehow we just don't see how it is with other folks until something comes up. Not having children makes less work, but it makes a quiet house, and right out to work all day, and no company when he did come in. Did you know John Wright, Mrs. Peters? Not to know him. I've seen him in town. They say he was a good man. Yes, good. He didn't drink, and kept his word as well as most, I guess, and paid his debts. But he was a hard man, Mrs. Peters, just to pass the time of day with him. Shivers. <sighs> like a raw wind that gets to the bone. Pauses, her eye falling on the cage. I should think she would have wanted a bird. But what do you suppose went with it? I don't know, unless it got sick and died. She reaches over and swings the broken door, swings it again. Both women watch it. You weren't raced round here, were you? Mrs. Peters shakes her head. You didn't know her? Not till they brought her yesterday. She, come to think of it, she was kind of like a bird herself. Real sweet and pretty, but kind of timid and fluttery. How she did change. Silence. Then as if struck by a happy thought and relieved to get back to everyday things. Tell you what, Mrs. Peters, why don't you take the quilt in with you? It might take up her mind. Why, I think that's a real nice idea, Mrs. Hale. 
There couldn't possibly be any objection to it, could there? Now, just what would I take? I wonder if her patches are in here, and her things. They look in the sewing basket. Here's some red. I expect this has got sewing things in it. Brings out a fancy box. What a pretty box. Looks like something somebody would give you. Maybe her scissors are in here. Opens box. Subtly puts her hand to her nose. Why? Mrs. Peters bends nearer, then turns her face away. There's something wrapped up in this piece of silk. Why, this isn't her scissors. Mrs. Hale, lifting the silk. Oh, Mrs. Peters! It's— Mrs. Peters bends closer. It's the bird. Mrs. Hale, jumping up. But, Mrs. Peters, look at it! It's neck! Look at its neck! It's all— other side, too. Somebody wrung its neck. Their eyes meet. A look of growing comprehension, of horror. Steps are heard outside. Mrs. Hale slips box under quilt pieces and sinks into her chair. Enter sheriff and county attorney. Mrs. Peters rises. County attorney, as one turning from serious things to little pleasantries. Well, ladies, have you decided whether she was going to quilt it or knot it? We think she was going to knot it. Well, that's interesting, I'm sure. Seeing the bird cage. Has the bird flown? Mrs. Hale, putting more quilt pieces over the box. We think the cat got it. County attorney, preoccupied. Is there a cat? Mrs. Hale glances in a quick, covert way at Mrs. Peters. Well, not now. They're superstitious, you know. They leave. County Attorney to Sheriff Peters, continuing an interrupted conversation. No sign at all of anyone having come from the outside. Their own rope. Now let's go up again and go over it piece by piece. They start upstairs. It would have had to have been someone who knew just the... Mrs. Peters sits down. The two women sit there, not looking at one another, but as if peering into something and at the same time holding back. When they talk now, it is in the manner of feeling their way over strange ground, as if afraid of what they are saying, but as if they cannot help saying it. She liked the bird. She was going to bury it in that pretty box. Mrs. Peters, in a whisper. When I was a girl, my kitten, there was a boy took a hatchet, and before my eyes, and before I could get there, covers her face an instant. If they hadn't held me back, I would have— Catches herself, looks upstairs where steps are heard, falters weakly. Hurt him. Mrs. Hale, with a slow look around her. I wonder how it would seem never to have any children around. No, Wright wouldn't like the bird. I think that sang. She used to sing. He killed that, too. Mrs. Peters, moving uneasily. We don't know who killed the bird. I knew John Wright. It was an awful thing that was done in this house that night, Mrs. Hale. Killing a man while he slept, slipping a rope around his neck that choked the life out of him. His neck choked the life out of him. Her hand goes out and rests on the bird cage. We don't know who killed him. We don't know. If there had been years and years of nothing, then a bird to sing to you, it would be awful. Still, after the bird was still. I know what stillness is. When we homesteaded in Dakota and my first baby died, after he was two years old, and me with no other then. Mrs. Hale, moving. How soon do you suppose they'll be through? Looking for the evidence. I know what stillness is. Pulling herself back. The law has got to punish crime, Mrs. Hale. I wished you'd seen Minnie Foster when she wore a white dress with blue ribbons and stood up there in the choir and sang. A look around the room. Oh, I wish I had come over here once in a while. That was a crime. That was a crime. Who's going to punish that? Looking upstairs. We mustn't take on. I might have known she needed help. 
I know how things can be. For woman. I tell you, it's queer, Mrs. Peters. We live close together and we live far apart. We all go through the same things. It's all just a different kind of the same thing. Brushes her eyes, noticing the bottle of fruit, reaches for it. If I was you, I wouldn't tell her her fruit was gone. Tell her it ain't. Tell her it's all right. Take this in to prove it for her. She... She may never know whether it was broke or not. Mrs. Peters takes the bottle, looks about for something to wrap it in, takes petticoat from the clothes bought from the other room, very nervously begins winding this around the bottle. In a false voice, My, it's a good thing the men couldn't hear us. Wouldn't they just laugh? Getting all stirred up over a little thing like a dead canary. As if that could have anything to do with... with... Wouldn't they laugh? The men are heard coming downstairs. Mrs. Hale, under her breath. Maybe they would. Maybe they wouldn't. No, Peters, it's all perfectly clear except a reason for doing it. But you know juries when it comes to women. If there was some definite thing, something to show, something to make a story about, a thing that would connect up with this strange way of doing it. The women's eyes meet for an instant. Enter Hale from outer door. Well, I've got the team around. Pretty cold out there. I'm going to stay here a while by myself. To the sheriff. You can send Frank out for me, can't you? I want to go over everything. I'm not satisfied that we can't do better. Do you want to see what Mrs. Peters is uh, going to take in? The lawyer goes to the table, picks up the apron, laughs. Oh, I guess they're not very dangerous things the ladies have picked out. Moves a few things about, disturbing the quilt pieces which cover the box. Steps back. No, Mrs. Peters doesn't need supervising. For that matter, a sheriff's wife is married to the law. Ever think of it that way, Mrs. Peters? Not just that way. <laughs> married to the law. <laughs> Moves toward the other room. I just want you to come in here a minute, George. We ought to take a look at these windows. Ah, <sighs> windows. We'll be right out, Mr. Hale. Hale goes outside. The sheriff follows the county attorney into the other room. Then Mrs. Hale rises, hands tight together, looking intensely at Mrs. Peters, whose eyes make a slow turn, finally meeting Mrs. Hale's. A moment Mrs. Hale holds her, then her own eyes point the way to where the box is concealed. Suddenly Mrs. Peters throws back quilt pieces and tries to put the box in the bag she is wearing. It is too big. She opens box, starts to take bird out, cannot touch it, goes to pieces, stands there helpless. Sound of a knob turning in the other room. Mrs. Hale snatches the box and puts it in the pocket of her big coat. Enter county attorney and sheriff. Well, Henry, at least we found out that she was not going to quilt it. She was going to, uh, what is it you called it, ladies? Mrs. Hale, her hand against her pocket. We call it, not it, Mr. Henderson. End of Trifles by Susan Glaspell Once to the stove. They are followed by the two women, the sheriff's wife first. She is a slight, wiry woman, a thin, nervous face. Mrs. Hale is larger, and would ordinarily be called more comfortable-looking, but she is disturbed now, and looks fearfully about as she enters. The women have come in slowly, and stand close together near the door. County Attorney, rubbing his hands. Ah, oh, that feels good. Come up to the fire, ladies. Mrs. Peters, after taking a step forward. I'm not cold. Sheriff, unbuttoning his overcoat and stepping away from the Trifles by Susan Glaspell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. First performed by the Provincetown Players at the Wharf Theatre, Provincetown, Massachusetts, August 8, 1916.
George Henderson, County Attorney, recorded by Chuck Williamson. Henry Peters, Sheriff, read by Delmar H. Dolbier. Lewis Hale, a neighboring farmer, read by Robert Hoffman. Left here yesterday. Oh, yesterday. When I had to send Frank to Morris Center for that man who went crazy. I want you to know I had my hands full yesterday. I knew you could get back from Omaha by the day, and as long as I went over everything here myself. Well, Mr. Hale, tell me what happened when you came here yesterday morning. Harry and I had started to town with a load of potatoes. We came along the road from my place, and as I got here I said, I'm going to see if I can't get John Wright to go in with me on a party telephone. I mean, Mrs. Peters, read by Margaret Espayat. Mrs. Hale, read by Christine G. Scene. The kitchen is the now abandoned farmhouse of John Wright. A gloomy kitchen, and left without having been put in order. Unwashed pans under the sink. A loaf of bread outside the bread box. A dish towel on the table. Other signs of incompleted work. At the rear, the outer door opens, and the sheriff comes in, followed by the county attorney and Hale. The sheriff and Hale are men in middle life. The county attorney is a young man. All are much bundled up, and go out with the stove, as if to mark the beginning of official business. Now, Mr. Hale, before we move things about, you explain to Mr. Henderson just what you saw when you came here yesterday morning. By the way, has anything been moved? Are things just as you left them yesterday? Sheriff, looking about. It's just the same. When it dropped below zero last night, I thought I'd better send Frank out this morning to make a fire for us. No use getting pneumonia with a big case on, but I told him not to touch anything except the stove. And you know Frank. Somebody should have been.